This is GM Word of the Week, and I'm Fiddleback. Ghost Town. Over the past few weeks, we've been looking at ghost stories, in particular at ghosts, spooks, and supernatural forces that haunt various things. You know, haunted houses, phantom ships, cursed paintings. But to wrap this month up, we're going to look at a particular sort of ghost story that has nothing to do with ghosts at all other than having ghost right there in the name. Sometimes, the scariest, most unsettling and unnerving things are things we can't see. Things that aren't even there. Take Bruce the Shark, for example. You know, from the classic movie that invented the concept of the summer blockbuster? Steven Spielberg's 1975 special effects extravaganza, Jaws a film about a quiet, coastal New England town during beach season. Except for the giant, vicious, great white shark lurking below the water's surface, a shark that later turned out to be immortal. And under the influence of a voodoo curse. But we don't talk about the sequels. Or the novelizations. Except it wasn't a special effects extravaganza, not really. There weren't that many big, over-the-top scenes of gory fish-on-tourist murder. And the few that were in the film looked kind of off. And that's because the special effects broke. No joke. See, back in those days, if you wanted a giant shark in your movie, you had to actually make one. Computer-based visual effects weren't a thing. This was also a time when, if you wanted lightning or a laser blast... You had to actually draw it right on the film. After you finished filming the movie. So Spielberg had his practical effects team make a giant robot shark. He wanted to have all sorts of big, gory, flashy scenes involving the robotic terror of the deep. The team decided to name the massive robot shark Bruce after Spielberg's lawyer, of all people. Someday, we've got to find a way to do a whole episode about characters named after lawyers. The problem was that poor Bruce couldn't handle water, which is kind of a problem for a robot shark. And the thing kept malfunctioning, so Spielberg had to find ways to limit how often he'd actually show the shark. And that led to all sorts of tricks. Shark point-of-view camera shots, a shark that drags floating buoys around, or people snatched and disappearing under the water and docks collapsing. Anything to either keep the shark off-screen or to assist it in staying afloat and working while on screen. Even the scenes that did use the robot shark had this unsettling, jerky quality. They make the shark seem like an unnatural monster. The point is that sometimes you don't need to show the monster. Sometimes you don't even have to have a monster. Sometimes you only need to show the results, the aftermath, and people's imaginations will do the rest. Which is why we're talking about ghost towns. Many of them are accompanied by legends of their former inhabitants haunting them, but those are incidental to the story of the ghost town itself. Ghost towns are, of course, the remains of a once thriving town that is now completely devoid of human life. It's a town where everything was going fine, and then one day something happened, and everyone left. And no one ever returned to repopulate the place. Now, the phrase ghost town is uniquely American, and it originates from literature and media in the early 1900s. The first recorded uses occurred between 1905 and 1910. It referred to a large number of towns located in the western and southwestern United States. They had once thrived, but were now completely abandoned. And the idea of the Old West ghost town became such a ubiquitous trope that for a while it was everywhere. Heck, once upon a time, the Brady Bunch even got stranded in an old Wild West ghost town in the desert. Now, ghost towns of that sort aren't scary in the same way the Amityville house is scary. They aren't scary because of what might be lurking in them. Instead, they're scary because they stand as lifeless monuments. Monuments to terrible, tragic events. Events with effects so severe, so enduring, inhabited chunks of land became lifeless. Most western ghost towns are the result of economics. One of the scariest and most depressing things in the whole of human experience. And we must admit 
that we here at the Word of the Week feel some sympathy towards economics. It gets a pretty bad rap. The best most people think of economics is that it's dry, dull, and weighty. It's all about graphs and math. Obscure terms like diminishing marginal utility and inelastic demand and homo economicus abound. The worst thing most people think? Economics is a theory that represents the worst of human self-interest and greed. And the reason economics got called the dismal science has nothing to do with any of that, despite the popular impression. The story goes like this. It's the mid-19th century. Historian Thomas Carlyle has started to refer to economics as the dismal science. He did so because economists at the time were making some pretty dire predictions. Predictions like the world approaching a breakpoint. It couldn't support humankind due to increasing population and other economic forces. And human technological innovation could not outpace that problem, they said. Which, on top of being the wrong story to explain the phrase, was plain wrong in general. And while we're at it, let's go ahead and say it. The Malthusian theory about overpopulation leading to mass famine and poverty? Also disproved by actual human history, no matter how often it's restated. For example, Paul R. Ehrlich's book, The Population Bomb, published in 1968? Every prediction in the book has utterly failed to come to pass. In fact, the exact opposite thing has happened in almost every case. But we digress. The point is, Carlyle was actually making a joke. See, at the time, people called poetry and literature, in an informal way, the gay sciences. In this case, the old sense of gay, meaning happy. Carlyle was doing a bit of wordplay. He pointed up the contrast and seriousness of economics by calling it the dismal science. That's all. In reality, economics is the study of how people make decisions. It encompasses individuals, groups, organizations, and governments. In particular, but not always, it looks at how to share, apportion, and use all the resources at our disposal. Most resources are finite and limited, and the decisions about how to use them are hard, which is what makes economics tick. If I have six cookies and seven people want them, how do I decide who gets what? Economics. So how did economics create so many abandoned towns in the U.S.? Well, let's talk about Bodie, California, as the most famous example of the phenomenon. Bodie was a boom town. That's an economic term. It refers to a town that has seen a massive increase in population due to a sudden economic change or windfall. And in this case, the sudden economic windfall was the discovery of gold deposits. This is back in the 1850s. At the time, gold mining was going through a bit of a boom in various places in the American frontier west. The western side of California's Sierra Nevada mountains was one such place. The foothills and slopes proved to have a bountiful supply. But by the late 1850s, those mines were all tapped out. Miners had dug up all the gold, and it was getting hard to find any more. And people were spreading farther and farther across the mountains to hunt for more. And then in 1859, William S. Bodie, discovered a small vein of gold on the eastern side of the Sierra Nevadas. Unfortunately, he died in a snowstorm that winter, so he never knew they named the place after him. By 1861, they established the Bunker Hill Mine on Bodie Bluff and built a mill nearby. At that time, it employed about 20 miners. And the miners chipped away at the modest vein of gold for years, making small profits. And then, in 1877, the Standard Mining Company bought it all. Standard expanded the mine's operation and discovered a massive load of gold. They hired up as many miners as they could to exploit the vein. In a single year, the mining camp's population soared to 5,000 people. In two years, the town's population had doubled. At that point, the town consisted of 2,000 buildings. It included 65 saloons, many brothels, gambling halls, even opium dens. The mining operation itself had expanded to support 30 different gold mines. The town gained a reputation for lawlessness, debauchery, and sin. It had grown far too fast to keep anything under control. As the population continued to grow, the railroad expanded into the area. Along with the trains came huge amounts of immigrant labor. And then, 
Four years later, in 1882, it was all over. The gold ran out. They laid off the miners. Resentment between unemployed miners and inexpensive imported immigrant labor grew. Many companies went bankrupt. There was no work to be had. People began to leave. And several major fires ravaged the town. The economics of the situation made rebuilding impossible. By 1932, 95% of the town's buildings had burned down. The Great Depression and Prohibition both hit the town even harder. According to one story, by 1945, the town had six inhabitants left, and all but one died before the decade was out. One man murdered his wife, and three others in town caught and executed him. Then those three men died under mysterious circumstances a short time later. In the end, the lone survivor simply moved on. Most American ghost towns are the result of similar slow, dismal economic tragedies. Sometimes, though, it is other human forces that leave a town abandoned. And sometimes those forces are much faster and flashier and deadlier. Take, for example, the story of the former Soviet city Pripyat located in present-day Ukraine. Pripyat is a radioactive ghost town. The disaster that befell it returned to the public consciousness in America recently, thanks to an HBO miniseries of, let's say, questionable veracity. If you don't know what disaster we're referring to, you will when we say the magic word. Chernobyl. The 1986 explosion of the Unit 4 nuclear reactor at the power station. The miniseries depicts the entire disaster as the fault of one man bucking for a promotion. It invents entire characters out of whole cloth. It even overplays certain aspects of the disaster. The miniseries gets the number of people killed by the disaster and the ways in which they died wrong. It portrays a cold, uncaring bureaucracy, one that wastes human life and ignores human tragedy throughout the emergency, which is, in our eyes, a tremendous shame because the reality was, by all accounts, horrific enough. But debunking a sensational bit of HBO docudrama is like shooting fish in a barrel with a bazooka. The failings of the series are well documented elsewhere. We'll confine ourselves to a brief synopsis of the disaster and the aftermath. One of the difficulties in discussing Chernobyl is the number of conflicting accounts. There were many records to sift through. And at the same time, either by accident or by intention, many disappeared. The Chernobyl incident isn't only the single largest nuclear accident in human history. The real problem is no other nuclear disaster compares to it by a huge margin. 50 deaths in the short term have a direct or indirect connection to the disaster. The monetary cost of the disaster was about $8.5 billion in today's money. The next most significant disaster by loss of life occurred in Fukui Prefecture in Japan. Four workers died in a steam explosion at the Mihama power plant. In a monetary sense, Pennsylvania's Three Mile Island partial meltdown is next closest. It didn't kill anyone, but the damages cost less than one-third those of the Chernobyl disaster. Again, that's not to downplay the disaster at all, because it can be hard to attribute injury or death to a radiation disaster. Evidence suggests an increased rate of various cancers as a result of Chernobyl. If you were a young person in the decade following Chernobyl, you had a tenfold increased chance of contracting thyroid cancer. Now, that's a change from one ten thousandth to one one thousandth of one percent, roughly, which doesn't seem like much. But official counts record 4,000 cancer-related deaths attributed to Chernobyl. Children of those involved in the cleanup show an increased rate of genetic disorder as well. But again, hard numbers are in short supply. So let's put all that aside and talk about the impact on Pripyat itself. First, let's discuss the disaster. The Chernobyl nuclear power station consisted of four fission reactors. All fission reactors work on the same basic principle. You have a fissionable material like uranium whose atoms are a bit unstable. Thanks to that instability, if you fire a subatomic particle into the nucleus of the atom, it will explode. That releases a huge amount of energy and more subatomic particles, which can then blast apart other atomic nuclei. That's why it's called nuclear fission. Nuclear because you're blowing apart atomic nuclei, fission because it comes from a conjugation of the Latin verb fendere, meaning to split apart. Anyway, 
The trick is capturing all the energy released by the fission. To do that, you surround the nuclear fuel with water. The water boils into super hot steam and drives large turbines. The turbines spin magnets inside a fixed magnetic field. And because of something called magnetic induction, electricity occurs. You might be familiar with induction thanks to stovetops and cell phones. Now, put aside all the various and conflicting accounts and sensational discussions. We'll condense the disaster itself down to a handful of simple facts. Due to the specific design of the reactors in question, it took a lot of electrical power to pump water into them. That's important to know. The water has to do two things at the same time. It must capture all the heat energy produced, and it must keep the reactor from overheating at the same time. Because given time, even uranium will melt. And if it melts, it will melt its way right through the bottom of a reactor core and into the ground. That's called a meltdown. As you might expect, there were emergency systems in place to keep the pumps running in the event of a loss of power. But there was a problem with the system. It took too long to engage. So technicians were testing the reactors. They wanted to know if a reactor could provide enough energy by itself to keep the water pumping. At least until they could bring the emergency system online. Well, they couldn't and the technicians started to lose control of the nuclear reaction because, as noted, the reaction will keep itself going. It's a chain reaction. It is, once started, very hard to stop as long as fissionable material remains. They made a series of frantic decisions to bring the reactor back under control. These only made the situation worse. Finally, the technicians made a desperate attempt to regain control. They flooded the core with water. The water immediately boiled, expanded as steam, and the entire reactor exploded. Including the thousand-ton concrete shielding cap that covered it. The uranium fuel melted. The graphite used to control the speed of the reaction caught fire and burned for the next five days. This spread radioactive smoke and carbon dust straight into the atmosphere. Attempts to control the fire only made it worse. To smother the blaze and absorb the radiation, they dumped thousands of tons of lead and sand into it. This only served to concentrate the heat in the reactor. It took a full week to get the fire and radiation under control. During this period, technicians led by a man named Alexander Akimov stayed in the plant. The desperation with which they worked earned them the name the Suicide Squad. Without regard for their own safety, they tried to bring the situation under control. Although, despite stories to the contrary, not all the Suicide Squad died. Among the survivors, three divers who swam through irradiated water to help control the coolant in the plant. Meanwhile, authorities in the city of Pripyat ordered evacuation. 30,000 inhabitants outside the power station left everything behind and fled. The Soviet government tried to keep things quiet, but 800 miles away in Sweden, detection stations saw a massive spike in radiation levels. The Soviet news agencies had to explain what happened. And as the disaster worsened, the evacuation expanded to 116,000 people. Years of decontamination efforts by hundreds of thousands of workers have occurred, yet Pripyat remains uninhabitable. To this day, it is an exclusion zone. The city is overgrown with trees and bushes, which help to clean radiation from the soil at least, but at the heart of it all is a heavy concrete sarcophagus. It entombs the remains of the still dangerous radioactive nuclear reactor. Yet the radiation levels in most of the city are now low enough that regular tours of the city occur, though they do tend to avoid the remaining radioactive hotspots. There's something particularly creepy about a radioactive ghost town becoming a tourist destination. But there's also something creepy about a tourist destination turning into a ghost town. Like, for example, Disney's Discovery Island in Bay Lake, Florida. The story of Discovery Island actually goes back to the late 1930s. Raz Island was a 12-acre island in Bay Lake, Orange County, Florida. Around 1938, the Raz family sold it to a radio personality named Delmar Nicholson for a mere $800. Uh, 
about $13,000 in today's money. Nicholson established it as a hunting preserve and lived there with his wife and his pet crane. Don't ask. It continued as a hunting location and wildlife preserve through several more sales, until 1965, when the Walt Disney Company acquired it as part of their acquisitions in Florida. They wanted to build a sister to their Disney theme park in Anaheim, California. Walt Disney World would open to the public in 1971. Disney conducted massive landscaping efforts on the island. They added 15,000 cubic yards of soil, increasing its size. They imported trees and boulders from China, South Africa, even the Himalayas. And in 1974, their Treasure Island attraction opened to the world. Disney dropped the pirate theme by 1978. Instead, the island became a botanical park with animal exhibits. They even received official accreditation as a conservation park. But then trouble started. In 1989, the state attorney filed 16 charges against the park and its employees, all related to animal abuse. There was a terrible problem with vultures, hawks, and owls attacking the show animals, even destroying the island's infrastructure and fixtures. And the employees retaliated. They destroyed nests and imprisoned huge numbers of wild birds, many in cruel, unventilated conditions that resulted in more than a few dead animals. Authorities even discovered a holding shed on the island containing over 70 vultures. As a result, the park's reputation took a serious blow, but the park managed to stay open. And then, in 1999, with no explanation, Disney closed it down and relocated all the animals. Now, it is likely that the cost of maintaining the park and low attendance were a factor, but by that point, Disney had opened their Animal Kingdom Wildlife Park, Discovery Island was too small and too old compared to the new preserve. But there were some odd rumors that surrounded the closing that persist to this day, especially given Disney's silence on the issue. Rumors persist that water on the island became contaminated with bacteria or parasites, but it's difficult to turn up any hard evidence on that front. But if you want to see what the abandoned resort ghost town on the Florida island looks like for yourself, you can. In 2009, a photographer named Shane Perez posted an article on his blog. It showed a series of pictures he and his friend took on an expedition to the abandoned island years before. The duo packed their camera equipment in watertight bags and swam across the lake to the island. They explored the entire thing, documenting their findings with photographs. And then they sat on it for several years. Why? Well, because the statute of limitations for trespassing in Florida is four years. That means after four years have passed, a claim for the crime of trespass is no longer valid. But Disney did ban Perez and his friend from all their theme parks forever. Discovery Island became a popular destination for amateur explorers, much to Disney's chagrin. Lots of intrepid explorers with lots of cameras have posted lots of pictures. Every year, tens of thousands of tourists wander the nuclear wasteland of Pripyat, Thousands visit the ghost town of Bodhi each year. They're all driven by an insatiable curiosity. See, we have to see things for ourselves. We need to witness. What's scary about Pripyat isn't that it's an empty, modern-looking town. It's the idea that unseen radiation could be killing us, and we'd not even know until too late. Bodhi is worrisome because it wasn't wiped out by a deliberate effort rather by the unseen and poorly understood by most of us forces of economics. And Discovery Island? What makes it troubling is that so much of what went on there was happening while the public was looking right at it, even enjoying it. And still, we didn't see. And when we can't see? When there's nothing to see or nothing left to see? When we have to fill in the gaps ourselves with our own imaginations? It's Bruce the Shark all over again. The things that intrigue us and frighten us and scare us the most are the things we don't see. This has been GM Word of the Week. It's written and researched by the angry GM and produced by me, Fiddleback. You can support us on Patreon at patreon.com slash GM Word of the Week. You can find more at gmwordoftheweek.com and theangrygm.com.